that's which is intrinsically elliptical. That's uh, one of the major problems. So what you have to do is to make the two-point correlation function. You have to see where the lattices are and how it's related to these neighbors. So you cannot see one, but you can see them together, statistically speaking. A typical value you can find for this gamma parameter is theta minus two. And a typical scatter you find in galaxies without lensing, forget about lensing, just a typical scatter in the pieces are 10 times bigger. So only very naively thinking, you know, you remember your first lab courses, now arrows go like square root of n, you need 100 points, so square root of 100 is 10, so the single noise will be 1. You need 1,000 objects, so the square root of noise will be 3. Right? So this is more or less what we need, but that's forgetting all the difficulties and all systematics which exist in this kind of field. So basically, what we're looking at is a coherent distortion of light bundles in a weak lens regime. You measure again this usually with the two point shear correlation function, it's called the shear power spectrum. And, it, you know, and if you lo it looks like the CMB uh, and the electromagnetic Maxwell equations, and that's why people refer to this as EMB moles, because this resembles an electric field and a, a magnetic field, because one has zero kernel, the other one has zero divergence. And the thing is, if you have a lower density here, the E mode looks like this, you have a lower density, then the ellipses of galaxies align perpendicular to the lower density. If you have another density, then it's the other way around, then everything wants to radiate out from you. Now the B mode is a little bit more twisted, literally. So you have if you have a lower density, things are going around you, but with a 45 degree angle. Or if it's another density, it's minus 45 degree angle. So basically what you have to do is correlate, you know, you can correlate the shapes if you see an orientation like this of gas in the sky, you can infer there's an over density here. If you see a shape like this, you can infer there's another density like this. You can probe the distribution of matter, and that's very good because that is sensitive to all matter, including dark matter. You don't have to see it. So it's one of the best ways to measure dark matter in the universe is through lensing. Because dark matter behaves the very same way as normal matter with respect to the density of the source. So, cosmic shear faces several challenges. If you want this review, you can take a look. I'll just summarize a little bit. First of all, there's the problem of intrinsic alignment of galaxies. It's not intrinsic ellipticity, that's easy to understand. Galaxies can be elliptical by themselves. Is that even though there's no lenses, sometimes because of structure formation, you can see, you maybe have seen these simulations where there's all these filaments of structure. So, if you have a filament of structure, maybe these ellipses are aligned by themselves without any lenses. So this is called intrinsic alignment, and uh, it's a really hard thing to do. You have to say it's hard systematic. And also, density on the other day depends on the nonlinear scales of your theory. So it's not perturbation. You cannot do everything with first order perturbation theory because uh, it depends a lot on the homogeneities of the matter distribution. So this requires simulation to understand. Okay. Uh, so that's a hard part. You cannot do things on, 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 with pen and paper, not even with uh, analytical calculation. And it also introduces some Gaussianities in your density distribution. The kappa is the, is the convergence of density basically is related to the surface mass density. There are also difficult as the systematics, the correlation between the weak lensing selection function and the background density, which means that when you look in, you have to see, can I detect this ellipticity anyway? Because if the image is very faint, it becomes very hard to detect the noise. And sometimes the, the, the ability of you to detect or not depends on the density of the field you're looking at. So that complicates things also. No. Yes. Uh, there is a distribution that is named Kappa distribution and it, it is monoxial. And then I don't understand it. It is in the distribution of Kappa. No? This is a convergence of lensing. Uh, I don't think there's nothing to do with this Kappa distribution. This is the sorry, the distribution of the convergence of lensing. Distribution of how much lens converges. And there'll be more on this. I don't think it's ready for So, um, and also, background galaxies can be obscured. You have a bright for a big foreground galaxy, you don't see that. So, we have to take all this into account. All this to say that, you know, cosmic shear is really very good, and that's one of the mainstream science goals of Euclid satellite. But there are more information lately beyond that. So, I'm going to talk here about the one point lens statistics actually simpler conceptually and this is encapsulated by the probability distribution functions of the lensing parameter there are three lensing parameters the convergence to kappa it tells you if you have a you have an image the kappa tells you how much it gets bigger or smaller in size 
the shear tells you how much surface is left in the leaves to the gamma. And the mirror is a combination of both, it tells you the flux difference, how much magnification we have in the final output. <laughs> so this, this uh, distribution, which are one point, so you don't have to correlate the positions of the sky, just counting them and make a distribution histogram. They are similar to work, they provide complementary information to the short shear. And uh, they can be used to descend uh, something called the observation selection function, which is the mount bias, which for instance very result in the paper science, where these guys realize that if you're counting some kind of uh, a particular kind of galaxy, which is called submillimeter galaxy, uh, they are uh, subject to large bias due to strong lensing. So you can see, you only see the number you see of them is very much related to the lensing between you and them. So you end up seeing a lot of, of the faint ones because of strong lensing. Okay. And they can be used uh, to model uh, the lensing of stellar candles, which are supernovae and gravitational waves nowadays. That's what I'm going to concentrate on. So we are working on the inverse lensing problem, which usually people think of lens as a noise on your supernovae or gravitational. Now they will think, they start to think now of as a noise on your gravitational wave data. So can we turn this noise into signal? Can we learn about the distribution by looking at this scatter? Can, uh, can you learn about cosmology looking at just these uh, fluctuations? And the answer is yes, otherwise there will be nothing stopped, right? So uh, we can consider the metrical aspect of the hero mass function with, uh, with this kind of tool. And it's a good, uh, as you observe, a good cross check, and uh, there's some papers here. And me, Valerio, and Luca have worked on this and managed to look at it uh, in the past few years, since 2013, I right? four years now. And this is part of what I call the cosmic recycling program because you just look at the noise of the data and try to find information there. So we developed, I'm not going to go there, I'm not going to leave any equations, just an idea. We developed a method called Method of the Moments, which relies on the following thing. We know how we can compute how lens is distorts for magnification. So magnification is very long uh, it's a very long process because most of the objects get demagnified a little bit fainter, and a few objects get much brighter. And this non Gaussianity, you can try to measure it on the data. And to measure it, what we did is we uh, wrote a likelihood that depends on the moments of the distribution. So the first moment is the mean. The second, now this, the center, the, this is just a moment. These are the central moments. So this is the bias, skewness, and closest. The moments with respect to the mean. And basically, usually you assume this to be zero because you have a Gaussian distribution. So no skewness. So lazy produce a skewness and a proposal that you can model. And that's what we did, we modeled it, right? Now, there's a very complicated uh, details in combined spaces that you know, we believe is kind of under control. There are a couple of papers out on this, I'm going to skip the criticalities. But the point is, if you can model it, then you can look at the supernovae noise and see if they, are, if they have a Gaussian or a Gaussian scatter. And not only do you know how much of Gaussian is, you know how much it evolves in redshift, that's the main point. You know that lens increases a lot as you go deep and deep in the universe because it's integrated. So we did some forecasts for that in the survey and LSSD, and we could measure sigma eight, which is the parameter basic the amplitude of the magnetic spectrum, and that's you can see this with 30% error bar and S 36% error bar, which is kind of cool. And we produce the, the final conclusion is the green conclusion here, which is the omega matter sigma eight plane, so a bunch of matter and this is homogeneity. So sigma eight equals zero means the universe is completely homogeneous, and you can rule out this with standard method. LSSD, of course, is much more constrained. I will just focus on the green, which is the final result. Well, actually, okay, I, I'll say something. So the red result here is the result coming only from lensing. It's just the lensing information. But because of spherical measured distances, the distance tells you where you are vertically, basically. So the new information is this red, course, but they, they are almost perpendicular to the green. And in fact, just to put in perspective, this is the recent paper by Kids that made the two sigma lensing conduce with weak lensing uh, shear measures, the cosmic shear. So it's a paper dedicated, a survey dedicated to that, and they got constraints which are comparable factor of two or three better than that. But this information for that comes for free. It comes just from the supernovae. You don't have to make a survey designed to do that. So it's interesting free information. And you can also measure the growth of structures. Because if you have this information in average P, you can tell how fast the structure is growing. So this is sometimes encapsulated 
It was marked by this gamma parameter. It's not the shear. It's the same letter, though. This is just telling you that uh, if, you, if you, the, stru the, the structure grows slower or faster than GR, GR is 0.55. So here means structure is growing faster and here is lower. So by combining the lensing of, of LCT supernovae, which is information with other uh, information like from Euclid, you can constrain both the sigma 8 and the gamma, both how much inhomogeneous is your matter today and how fast is this homogeneity growing with time. And it's very interesting because this gamma parameter is a measure of modified gravity. Anything which is not 0.55 means you're not in general relativity. So it's a simple, very simple way of parameterizing this. Now, going back to the lens PDF, what I've been doing in the past uh, year or two, is thinking of the problems inside because it's very nonlinear problem. So one of the things I was thinking is like, why can I be affecting my uh, information? One thing is bias, because we have been neglecting bias here. Just thinking about cosmologies like matter only. Now, bios affect the structure in high density regions a lot. So what we did is, okay, we took a set of simulations, which are bionic simulations by Klaus Dolan, and we did a full ray tracing analysis, full numerical analysis of this to quantify the effect of bios. And the good thing about the simulation is that for each box that it does in the universe with bios, it does the exactly the same box, only with that method. So by doing the difference, we have the effect of only bios. There's no other change. Um, so we did, you know, in all, all these numerical simulations, you have to go into technicalities, but we did boxes of different size. Now, our main results come from boxes of 100 megaparsecs, 128 megaparsecs uh, in size, with a, a mass resolution of that matter of 7 to the 8. So each point in my simulation is 100 million or 7, 700 million solar masses. So that's what you can do because if you want to simulate the universe, you cannot go. Too much detail, but it's okay. 700 million is still enough that you can have many of them in each galaxy. So you can capture it, you know, galaxies and structures, but nothing much smaller than a galaxy can find this. The bodies also have a similar uh, mass resolution. Uh, so, so these are very high mass resolution runs, and uh, uh, no, but you cannot have any box much larger than 12 megaparsecs, otherwise, you never finish the simulation. But anyway, so we use this to understand the effect of bodies. Uh, and we did a full technical paper on all the possible uh, numerical uh, dependencies that you have here. And this is just a so plot. I don't know if you can see the resolution. This is the dark matter only simulation, and this is the bionic simulation. So going back and forth by eye, you don't see much difference. Forget about this plane here. This is a ratio one. From here to here, you don't see much difference by eye. But if I zoom in a small region, you can clearly see that here I have less clumps than down here, but I have many more clumps. Because of the bias affect the clumping in small scales. They also affect a little bit with so this has AGN feedback. This at some point also include the magnetic fields and uh, supernova feedback and has, uh, all this uh, sorry the cooling and the cooling mechanism of the gas. So it does affect structure in small scale. So this will mean that sunlight coming from behind this guy here is different when you compute the dark matter only or by the simulation. And this is an interesting part of the, of the power spectrum of lensing. And, uh, of convergence again, and this is multiple. So these are the components of the binary simulation. These are black holes, no primordial black holes, like look at normal black holes. Uh, stars, which means gas, which has compact, uh, sorry, which is dense, compact, and gas, which is still free around, going around. Of course, you know, my stars have 800 million solar masses, that's a small detail, but they behave compactly. And you can basically see a dark matter. So basically you see, dark matter is really still the most important, this laser spade. It's still the most important contribution. Uh, but stars, after multiple of 10,000, they become the dominant contribution. So this is interesting because you think something like primordial black holes, they will behave like the yellow line. So they become important in small scales. Let's move on. I don't have much time. Uh, Basically, okay, so what I think you're saying is that, well, oh, this is a technical kind of this. So these are some results, which are actually free, uh, at different angular resolutions. So that tells you, if you want to say the probability of lensing small objects or large objects, of you know, things which are smaller than a galaxy, or things which are the size of a galaxy, or the size of large galaxies. So it's saying, in average, how much a, a galaxy of one arc second is magnified? Or what's the probability that will have multiple images? So we have three 
rows here, this is the convergence, the shear, the magnification. So the magnification is easy to understand. So the magnification of 1 means no change. The magnification of 10 means that the image is 10 times brighter. 100, the image is 100 times brighter. And tells, this tells you the probability of this happening. So from this, you can compute now the probability of any single gas in the sky of being multiple images of phaser or anything you want to have multiple images. You know, and the magnification you can have. I'm running out of time. Uh, you can also quantify, sorry, so this was dark matter and hybrid. So if you see, this part of the distribution changes when you have hybrid. So this is what we quantify. Okay? This, and the convergence also will change a lot. So in small scales, it will change a lot. In large scales, it will not. The, the peak of the, yeah, small events, yeah, I'm not going to skip this. So one of the results, you know, that simplifies this in some numbers is the probability of having multiple images. So this is the multiple image probability in parts of a million, parts per million, and different ratios, and different angular apertures. So if you think of something like 1.7 arc second, the probability of having multiple images in the dark matter simulations at ratio 2 is like one part in a million. If you go to the bionic part, it goes to 47 parts in a million. You know, something is two parts in a million, it becomes 300. So by comparing back and forth, you see that the probability of having multiple images with the Uh, bionic runs is around 30 to 50 times higher, which means that if you don't consider bios, you are making the calculation wrong by a factor of 30 or 50. So it's completely imperative if you want to talk about multiple uh, image probability that you consider the bios. It changes completely. Okay? One, one, one. Here I getting, I was getting like I was getting before, so I can complain, but I'll skip this, I'll skip that. Fine. I'm going to go to the conclusion. So, what we've been trying to, oh, it's okay, we can go back to the discussion. Part. What we're trying to focus here is that we want to go back and understand this lensing probability to one point distribution. Okay? And the thing is, there's a huge impact of some lensing in the high density regions, if you consider the bias. And second, uh, supernova lensing, which affects objects at rest bigger than 0.4 can already measure <coughs> the structure and the growth of structure. And if you can combine that with a little thing that I didn't discuss here, which is the peculiar velocity of lensing, and that affects only nearby sources. So they are, one is in the plate, the other is not. So they are completely independent. So you can combine both of them to get even more information on the structure of the universe by just looking at the noise of your uh, standard candle uh, lens. So I think I have enough. I thank you for this. Now, our hybrid simulations is, is 
is the beta, not the 16 million. So we are off by a factor of 3, which is kind of what I was trying to say. So we are not there yet. But the dark matter only is wrong by a factor of 250. So that, if you know, if you are very confident, it means that we are getting close to convergence here. So at some point, maybe we converge. But to prove this convergence, is, we're not there yet at all. Does that answer the set of questions? Okay, let's thank you again.